Thank you. Um, my name is Maria del Socorro Limon Castro, and I wanted to, um, to welcome the speakers who are not from Texas to actually to Occupied Mexico. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> This is still Occupied Mexico. We have not forgotten. <laughs> My name is Maria El Socorro Limon Castro, or Maria Limon for short. And um, I, I have worked for the Foundation for Compassionate Society for about five years now. And you know, it's a nonprofit organization, but I do love the fringe benefits. Not everybody can say in their lifetime that they could introduce Angela Davis, right? <laughs> this is the hand that shook that hand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been very hard pressed to introduce a woman who needs no introduction, a woman who, in my eyes, is walking history. So I've been walking around asking my friends and coworkers for the last few days, asking, asking them what they think of when they hear a the name Angela Davis. Anna Sisnet spoke of possibilities and presence. The simple knowledge of Angela as a professor of philosophy at UCLA opened the possibilities of being in a way that Anna had not seen before. Lillian Stevens thinks of traffic tickets. <laughs> it's a good story. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, she spoke of how her introduction to the revolution was to um, have her driver's license revoked because of all the traffic tickets she got. She, refu she refused to remove her free Angela Davis and all political prisoners bumper stickers from her car. <laughs> She's right there. <laughs> She said police would drop out of the sky to give her tickets. <laughs> Aaron Rodgers, with a tear in her eye, or at least it looked like anyway, spoke of how, her, how Angela Davis's last presentation at UT changed her life. Not only her life, but the entire political context of the campus at that time. UT uh, Austin, for the very first time, uh, elected a black lesbian as their student body president after Angela Davis spoke. <laughs> and as for this Chicanita from Aslan, <laughs> Angela Davis represents vast and open possibilities. She fed my imagination when I was just coming to my own politically. I never met her, I never thought I would ever meet her, but I heard about her and I read about her and I marveled at her presence on this planet. Angela is a woman who maintains the integrity required of anyone who holds her commitment to struggle against all forms of oppression. And this Ms. Davis has done for decades throughout this country's contemporary political history at great personal risk. My life has been changed by her, uh, my life has been changed by her words, challenged by her example, and enriched by her presence. Today, Angela Davis is a tenured professor in the History of Consciousness program at UC Santa Cruz. She, yes, when, I think Ronald Reagan said she would never be allowed back in the UC system. <laughs> she received the distinguished honor of an appointment to the UC Presidential Chair in African American and Feminist Studies. Yes. And as Patty Salas, my other coworker, put it, Angela Davis is the most chingona professor on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Roughly translated, it means powerful. <laughs> Angela Davis talks the talk and walks the walk in some of the most difficult places among the most challenging situations. Ms. Davis, con Ms. Davis continues her work advocating for prisoners' rights. She conducted a series of interviews with incarcerated women for a research project that seeks to develop ideas for new and progressive legislation around the penal system. And Angela Davis, the writer and thinker, continues to provoke, inspire, and urge others to keep thinking and working right alongside her with essays, articles, and uh, with a forthcoming book, the working title of which is Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, and Billie Holiday, Black Women's Music and Social Consciousness. Please help me welcome Angela Davis. <laughs> Good evening. 
Well, this has been a full evening, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, and some of you came at one o'clock, right? At nine o'clock. Well, I certainly would have come to Austin sooner if I had only known. <laughs> But of course, it is an honor to be able to address you after having listened to the, the wonderful, inspiring words of uh, Mililani Trask and Maria Jimenez and Gloria Steinem. Uh, you know, I was sitting there thinking to myself, you know, what is there left to say? <laughs> um, but I don't know, you're probably tired by now. No. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> okay, well I wanna begin by suggesting that particularly at this time in the history of our country and the history of the globe, radical Activism is needed more than ever before. And I also want to suggest that women and women's issues need to be forefronted in this radical activism. Some of you might think it's sort of archaic to talk about Radical activism, after all, that's something that is generally associated with, um, with a generation that um, is approximately the age of... <laughs> Many ladies said, don't count me in. <laughs> and there was something else that I was, uh, that, that, started to bother me somewhat as I, I, I sat here, you know, listening to these powerful words. Um, I started to wonder, now who is the youngest among us? <laughs> I know how old Gloria is, I know how old Mililani is, because she told me today. 45. But I don't know how old... Okay, so Mililani is the youngest. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> but I think we still need some women much younger. You know, one of the issues that we really need to begin to address is intergenerational uh, communication, and particularly the importance of, of accepting young women as leaders, as leaders. As a matter of fact, I don't think we can move forward if young women, young people are not at the forefront of our struggles. Because you have to be a little crazy <laughs> to get out there and do the things that are necessary in order to begin to change the world. And when you consider how old Well, no, actually, I was going to say, when you consider how old, I, I know that, that everyone sitting on the stage this evening became involved at a very young age, right? Am I right? Am I right? So where are you who are the age we were? <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, the next time there's an enormous gathering like this, some of you have to be up here as well. There is so much that, so many challenges that are facing us, challenges which require us to think in feminist, anti-racist, anti-homophobic, anti-capitalist ways. As a matter of fact, when we want to talk about new values, feminist values, I think those values have to be anti-racist values. You know, those values have to be anti-capitalist values. And the challenge of the women's movement today, women's movements, women's movement today is to figure out how to turn back this terrible tide of reaction that threatens to overcome all of us. These are dangerous times. These are very dangerous times. How can we prevent the attempt to dismantle affirmative action programs all over the country? for people of color and for women of all racial and ethnic backgrounds. What can we do to stop the rise of immigrant bashing? I mean, I'm coming from California, I'm sad to say, because California is the state where immigrants from Mexico, people from Mexico who are called immigrants, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, I don't think there's anybody in this country who really has the right not to call herself or himself an immigrant except the indigenous people. But in California, People from Mexico and Central America are cruelly beaten. You heard about you know, what happened in Riverside about a month or so ago. In California, Proposition 187 was passed. How can we prevent the criminalization, the demonization of people who are called non-citizens? And then how can we prevent the incarceration of, the incarceration of ever-increasing numbers of men and of women as well? As a matter of fact, the rate of increase in the arrests of women is about twice that as the rate of increase in the arrest and incarceration of men. So if you look at the historical trajectory down the line, um, across the, 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 the millennium, you're also going to see vast numbers of women. And most of them are going to be women of color who will populate these new um, institutions, these new places, these new prisons that they, the, these new places that are a part of a, 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 a rising punishment industry. That is what we're going to be facing. How can we prevent the overrunning of the educational system by the prison system? How can we bring an end to the to sexual violence, which seems to swell. Um, you know, how can we integrate a challenge to homophobia into all of the work that we do? I've just listed some of the urgent questions facing us. This is the most complicated historical moment I have ever experienced. Um, some of you young activists or emergent 
activists, i.e. after the meeting, <laughs> you know, tend to, tend to romanticize the 60s, am I right? Am I right? Okay, so you have totally demystified the notion that radicalism uh, is a 60s phenomenon. Have you? <laughs> okay, there is at least one person in the house who has done that work. Um, you know, but oftentimes people who, who moved into social political activism during that period, you know, tend to, to respond nostalgically to the challenges that I, um, some of the challenges that I listed, and tend to, to assume that, well, if only we could organize now like we organized back then, then things would be different. Um, But of course, during that period, when the student movement swept the country, when the civil rights movement and movements in Latino, black, Asian American, Native American communities began to develop and became widespread, when the women's movement emerged, our notions of struggle were rather simple. We embraced a rather simplistic notion of who counted as the enemy and who counted as our friend. As a matter of fact, we could sort of draw a line and argue that everyone on the other side of the line was the enemy. Right? And sometimes that line was a racial line. Sometimes that line was a gender line. Sometimes that line was a class line. But we knew who the enemy was. No doubt about it. But in those days, what we have come to call using, con what we come to call interlocking oppressions or um, matrix of domination or intersecting um, oppressions, and you recognize some of these terms, right? Yeah? <laughs> Do you? Yes. All right. Let's have a little response here now. Um, but during those days, of course, this, this, this notion of a complicated interaction of, of categories of gender and class and sexuality and race sort of mutually informing each other, determining each other, um, that had not even been thought of. You know, as a matter of fact, if you go back to the civil rights period, gender hadn't really been thought of. I mean, in the beginning, we didn't even, Gloria was talking about the, uh, the, the, the sort of um, ultimate um, a withering away of gender, but during the civil rights period, we didn't even have the word gender. As a matter of fact, as the women's movement emerged, we, emerged, we used the word sex, right? Uh, sexuality wasn't in the picture. The word homophobia hadn't even been invented, right? <laughs> but at the same time, and I think this is really important for us to um, understand today, those movements, however um, simplistic they may have been from a historical perspective of those of us who are situated in the late 1990s, However simplistic they may have been, those movements changed our common sense and changed the common sense of the entire country, changed our common sense notions of race, and changed our common sense notions of gender, of race and racism, of gender and misogyny. 
Um, now, you know, what has happened recently, well, recently is uh, a matter that is quite relative, I suppose, particularly when we're in an intergenerational gathering. Um, Well, I guess I might say, since the Reagan-Bush era. <laughs> that's recently for some of us. <laughs> yeah, that's like prehistory for others, right? <laughs> now, what we have witnessed is the, the rise of a um, conservative movement that has managed by now to reverse those common sense notions which we transform through movement and struggle. And as a matter of fact, um, today, so many people assume that racism no longer exists. Oh yes. As a matter of fact, when something like uh, the beating of a black man in Los Angeles takes place, it's sort of greeted as this horrible um, holdover of an era that went by a long time ago. If you look at the basis on which the arguments against affirmative action are made, the assumption is that racism no longer exists. Because all of the laws, or a good deal of the laws, um, according to which the South was segregated and according to which discrimination was inscribed uh, into um, the law, because those laws have been changed, the assumption is that racism no longer exists. But what's happened is that the legal basis for segregation has been eradicated. Racism mutates just as um, sexism mutates. It becomes something new and different uh, as history unfolds. And now, as a matter of fact, and I think this is especially important for feminists of all racial and ethnic backgrounds to recognize, racism is more deeply entrenched in the political economy of the United States than ever before. <laughs> than ever before. It is more strongly entangled with misogyny than ever before. I mean, it's true that black people may not be told today where to sit on buses and trains or where to eat or where to go to school or where to live, although some of this, of course, still happens. But racism is still very much at work in determining who goes to prison and who doesn't, who's destined to rely on the welfare system and who isn't, who's considered an immigrant and thus scapegoated in multiple ways and who isn't. And one of the things I think we need to do is is, is think very deeply about the extent to which we tend to conceive of issues of race in black-white terms. So we have to move beyond the black-white binary in the way we think about issues of race. And that, of course, is especially important in this part of the country. You know, many people, I was talking about affirmative action, many people have pointed out that affirmative action isn't as um, new as it appears to be. It's assumed that it came about as a result of the civil rights uh, struggles. Because affirmative action models were developed as far back as the New Deal. As a matter of fact, Karen Botkin Sachs wrote, has written an article which is called How Jews Became White Folks. Uh, <laughs> And uh, she points out that, um, that the, the New Deal uh, benefits, uh, the GI Bill, for example, um, really helped 
Jews and, and um, Europeans, Eastern Europeans, ethnic Europeans, to sort of pull themselves up. It wasn't so much by their own bootstraps that they pulled themselves up. They were helped by the government. And the fact is that large numbers of, of GIs of color received dishonorable discharges and therefore were not eligible for the GI Bill. So that's, I mean, that's something uh, to think about. Uh, I was actually going to say a little bit more, but I think I'll move on because I want to, we, we want to have, are we still going to have a question and answer period? Okay, well, okay, well let, let me try to speed up. Uh, I want to actually um, join with uh, all of my sisters who've emphasized the importance of looking at um, the, the local um, struggles that we are engaged in within a global context. It is so important to think about transnational capitalism these days um, and to, to, to think deeply about the extent to which people equate, quote, democratic values with capitalist values. It's the responsibility of feminists, I think, to contest that equation. <laughs> and to make it legitimate to develop the kinds of open critiques of capitalism. We can't be satisfied with this system. Many people assume that, well, socialism didn't work. Right? In the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, um, because of the lack of economic and political democracy, it didn't work. Well, that might be true, but that's the socialist experiment that they made didn't work. That doesn't mean that there's no possibility of envisioning anything beyond capitalism. We cannot be content with this system. And I know I have the right to say at my age, which, and I've, I, I, I'm into my um, um, second half century, uh, I'll put it that way. But I think I have the right to say that I have struggled too long and too hard to give up at this point. And let's just talk for a moment about the ways in which transnational capital uh, migrates all over the world at will. It does not recognize national borders. And as a matter of fact, oftentimes the very roots that are carved out by transnational corporations seeking cheap labor, running from organized labor, seeking cheap labor pools are the circuits that are used by people who then come from those countries to the United States. But we don't hear any talk about immigrant corporations, do we? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And then at the same time, these corporations fleeing organized labor, seeking, and, and do you know only 12% of the labor force in this country now is organized? That is even less than when the great organizing drive began in the 1930s. But what happens, of course, is that communities die as a result of the fact that these corporations close down shop. They complete, they leave an economic vacuum. People lose their jobs, the tax base for education disappears, and then of course new economies move in. And what are those new economies? What do you think those new economies are? 
the what? No, 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 no. If people in this community don't have a job and therefore don't have money, Walmart is not going to move into that community because nobody's going to be able to buy anything there. Not even Walmarts. <laughs> but what happens is that you have the basis for which alternate, alternate economies can flourish, drug economies, economies in sexual services. And that, in turn, leads people directly into the punishment industry. These are the people who are then criminalized. These are the people who are pointed out as the enemy, right? And if you look at the way many people are responding in this country, all you have to do is evoke the notion of crime. And people are willing to do anything. The most cruel things imaginable. Like putting, putting six-year-old kids in juvenile hall. I mean, granted, the six-year-old boy did a horrible thing when he beat up an infant. You know, but since when do you put children that age in jail? Or convicting parents whose son committed a crime for not sufficiently supervising the son. You see where family values will take you. It will take you towards fascism. It really will. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have the ideological figure of the immigrant who strikes fear into the hearts of many people in this country. And, not, and we're talking about a racism which is embraced you know, by people of color as well in this anti-immigrant uh, um, uh, campaign. We have the figure of the criminal. The criminal is usually figured as a young black man, right? And as a matter of fact, between 20 and 29 percent, um, all young black men between the ages of 20 and 29, uh, if you consider that group, something like 32.5 percent of them are now in prison. In California, 40 percent of all young black men are in prison. In California, 75% of all young black men have been arrested at one time or another, 75%. And of course, when you look at those people who are in prison, the majority of them are in for non-assaultive crimes. But when we think about those who are in prison, who, who do we think about? Immediately, people go to the child molester, the murderer, right? And this is the basis uh, on which fear is evoked, which then makes it impossible for people to think critically. And therefore, they assent to a punishment industry, which is creating a society that is increasingly an incarcerated society. So, I want to conclude by making some suggestions uh, regarding organizing strategies. In order to meet the very complicated challenges we face as we move toward the next millennium, our consciousness needs to reflect the complexity of the way our lives are structured. Uh, Bernice Reagan has pointed out, and many of you have probably read her, her essay, uh, that coalition work needs to be a central strategy in late 20th century organizing practices. It's not the only kind of work. As a matter of fact, it's important to do work that isn't coalitional work, because we shouldn't assume that we are in these absolute essential communities from which we can never um, exit. You see what I'm saying? 
that, that somehow black people constitute a community, or that Chicanos constitute a community. I think we have to stop thinking in those singular terms. You know, because there are a whole lot of black people with whom I would not want to make community with. You know, I don't want to make community with, uh, with Clarence Thomas and all of those, you know, guys. So. so we have to start thinking in political terms. You know, as a matter of fact, I think uh, we, have to, we have to begin to politicize our, our identities, to consider our identities not fixed but flexible that can be established in accordance with the political projects we do and the political goals that we posit. But I do want to say in this brief conclusion that in the coalitional work that we are doing, we need to do some um, unlikely coalitional work. We need to sort of create formations that are based on the notion of unlikely coalitions. So, and, and, and what, I, what I've been thinking about are coalitions between students and prisoners, for example. Students and prisoners working together. Uh, because that's the only way we're going to save the educational system. You know, otherwise the punishment industry is going to devour all of the funds that really ought to be directed toward the educational system. Another coalition that should be encouraged is, is, is one that would bring together welfare rights activists and gay and lesbian activists. Because both welfare mothers and gays and lesbians are directly targeted by the racialized and sexualized conservative emphasis on, quote, family values. <laughs> You know, so I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe we need to, to have some more marches or something. And what would a march look like, you know, with, with welfare mothers and gays and lesbians? Not that the two are mutually exclusive, but, but that would be a very powerful demonstration. We also need to think about coalitional work that brings together both legal and undocumented immigrants. I don't want to use the term legal. Uh, documented and undocumented uh, immigrant youth on the one hand and young African American, um, Asian American, uh, Latino, Native American youth who are all targeted by this devious criminalization process that replaces the uh, legitimate need for jobs, education, and health care with a very effective demonization of these groups. And I think that in that context, it's certainly time to revive the demand for a reconsideration of the eight-hour day. We need a shorter work day. And Gloria was talking about history and memory. The eight-hour day hasn't been around forever. Workers fought for an eight-hour day because it was the 10-hour day. And then they fought for the 10-hour day when they were working 12 hours a day. And certainly with this crisis that we're facing, you know, one of the ways in which we could, we could talk about jobs for undocumented immigrants as well as for vast unemployed people among youth in communities of color would be a shorter work day. You see? But I want to end there because those are just some ideas that, that I've had and I know that there are some young people in this audience, there are some young women in this audience who can come up with some ideas that are far more radical and far more um, appealing because you have a sense of what people, young women and men of your generation are prepared to do. So I want to appeal to those of you who are, uh, I mean, you, you don't become an activist by converting, so this is not like a conversion speech, right? 
But I'm just asking you uh, to begin to try to concretely implement what you obviously already believe, if I can predict that from the response that I've gotten in the audience today. So I want to conclude by thanking the Foundation for a Compassionate Society, Genevieve Vaughan, and all of the wonderful you know, women that uh, we've, we've seen and heard from today for giving us the opportunity to come together, uh, to hold hands with each other, and to think creatively and radically about the possibilities of the future. Thank you very much. Anna Sisnet. Um, this is a question time, so come up. Uh, there's microphones, where are they? Well, just come up here if you have a question. I'd also like to thank my co workers, Genevieve, and most of all, the speakers. Well, where are the mics? I would like to invite the young women in order to meet the challenge that was just um, placed to us. Um, to invite the young women, I would say 25 and under, to speak first. 30 and under? 30 and under. 30 and under. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Come on up. <laughs> okay, this has to do with what Angela was speaking about, and it's kind of a question to you, but also a statement. Um, since a lot of the laws that are placed on us um, aren't really created by us, a lot of them are patriarchal, made to keep us down, I'm wondering how you feel about activism that breaks the law. Civil disobedience is great. Civil disobedience is great. All right. So go out there, and if you don't agree with the law, then you let them know that. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, civil disobedience is a proved tactic of struggle. It has a long history, but it needs to be organized. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, I had a question. Um, this is really interesting because I just saw this in the Chronicle today and I hadn't heard about it or anything that um, with, I'm trying to, I'm 27, I'm trying to go back and get my master's degree. I'm working, I'm making in the low 20s and uh, it's, uh, I want to know how everybody gets the energy and the time with my over eight hours a day job and uh, I have no children, and yet I still can't seem to find enough time, and I'm interested in this, and the interest is there, and um, I'm, going to the, I'm going back to the LBJ School of Public Affairs and communication, and I'm, but it's so difficult. I don't, I don't know how, to get, how anybody has enough time or gets the time to do this. It's like, I'm, by the time I'm done in bed, it's 11 or 12 at night, and I'm tired, and I haven't even done anything that you have done. I mean, I, I haven't even read the books that I want to read and that kind of thing. And so my main concern is that, is mm -hmm. how to... <laughs> That's to anybody. Because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm not so great at using my own time, okay, so I'm not... But, <laughs> But I, but I do think that we need to think of, of social revolution as something that is just part of our lives. You know, it's like brushing our teeth. We do it all the time. If, if we think it has to be a big thing, an enormous thing, and we put it off, uh, then we never do it. But if we just say to ourselves, uh, I'm going to write five outrageous letters every week. You know, you can do it while you're watching The Late Show when you get in bed at 11. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to give 10% of my uh, salary to social justice of some kind, whatever it is that you think, you, you know, you want to give it to. 
I mean, it's the best investment you'll ever make. You know, the money isn't going to be worth anything next year anyway. So <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to go to one uh, demonstration a month just to keep my blood tingling, you know, whatever. And, and for me, I think also, uh, I, I think that, that, that women especially, um, wherever we come from, are, are kind of the one group that doesn't have a country or a neighborhood or a bar. So, so I think it's, I find it very helpful to have a group of women I can meet with once a week and be encouraged by them. And you can think of outrageous things to do together. Right. I was just wondering, I wanted to ask the question, um, how did y'all know that this is what y'all wanted to do? When did y'all come about that you just found out this is what I want to do, this is my calling, and how did you go about doing that? You want to answer that? <laughs> you know, let me sort of respond to the first three questions as well. Uh, one of the things about human rights and social justice work is that it is exhausting and burnout is something that we all suffer from. And what we have to remember is that part of being a woman is sustaining yourself. And one of the things that we have to guard against is our tendency to give so much that we bankrupt our, our, own, our own spirit. Uh, and so you have to set in your priorities yourself and you have to remember as I do that, you know our spiritual practice mm -hmm. is the wellspring of our energy. But if you're to lead your nation, if you're to lead your people, you have to have a spiritual balance. And so sometimes when I get on that point, I just have to withdraw from things. But the creator uh, and the spirit is what renews us. It's the wellspring of our culture. So prayer is something that is not often <coughs> spoke of, spoken of at meetings like this, but it is our way to find our connection to our woman's spirit. As far as feeling the calling, you know, I fought against it for many years, uh, and I tried all kinds of things. I thought when I went to law school, I was going to make money, have a Jaguar, all these kind of things. <laughs> but it never did happen to me, and I, I found that there was, a great, um, there was a great calling that I had. And, you know, if I had heard it when I was at your age, I probably, uh, if I had heard it and, and not denied it, I probably would have had a much happier life, but you know, you, you have all these things that the paternalistic side, society puts on you, so you go, no, I, I can't be this or I can't be that. Uh, but the thing to do is to listen in your heart. And when you hear that call, if you know that it is for you, walk that path. If it doesn't fit you, discard it. Uh, a good test is when night time comes, if you cannot sleep, with what you have done that day, with what you have said, you know you are doing the wrong thing. Well, these guys are asking hard questions. No, a answer. This is my first time here, and I just want to just say that I've never been to like a place where um, you, women get up and talk about that stuff, and I was just, just want to say I, I really had a good time, and I'm... <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.